it is an utmost pleasure for us to have on this international program someone who is so much interested and involved in international uh, collaborations and in dermatopathology as uh, Dr. Rosica Lazova, who is an associate professor of dermatology and pathology at the Department of Dermatology, Yale University. Uh, Dr. Lazova completed a pathology residency at the University of Rochester and trained in dermatopathology with Dr. Bernard Eckerman. She's an associate professor of dermatopathology and dermatology and pathology and the director of dermatopathology residency and fellowship program at the Department of Dermatology, Yale University, New Haven, uh, USA. Her main interest is in melanocytic lesions and particularly spots with neoplasm of and melanoma. Uh, she founded the Yale Spitzoid Neoplasm Repository, which is an international biospecimen and data collection bank. Recently, she introduced imaging mass spectrometry as an ancillary method in the diagnosis of difficult melanocytic lesions. Dr. Lazova has taught many courses and directed numerous sessions at national and international meetings in the United States and throughout the world. She has numerous publications and textbooks. Uh, she's on the editorial board of many scientific journals. And she's also the vice president of the International Society of Dermatopathology. So it's a great pleasure for us to have her on this program because she is uh, uh, extremely involved in uh, dermatopathology. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, Rosica, to start with your lecture. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, thank you, Laszlo, for this wonderful introduction. I'm not sure I deserve it, but I'd like to welcome everyone to this lecture series. And I would like to uh, commend you and your um, uh, friend for putting this together, which is a wonderful forum for dermatopathologists throughout the world to uh, listen to great presentations, um, to get new knowledge, and to be able to uh, learn a lot and discuss important uh, topics in our subspecialty. So this deserves an applaud and uh, a thank you for all this hard work. Um, I will have a very basic talk uh, today, spongiotic dermatitis. Uh, basic in terms of uh, the fact that I will cover just basic terms and show examples of different um, different variety of, of spongiotic dermatitis. Um, and of course, um, I would be happy to discuss any particular um, subject or, or, or questions that may arise. Let's start with uh, spongiotic dermatitis. And spongiotic dermatitis is a histopathologic term. The clinicians rarely say, oh, the patient has spongiotic dermatitis. They say, the patient has eczema, eczematous dermatitis. So that's what they usually use as a clinical term, but because there is spongiosis as a feature uh, of histopathology as the main histopathologic finding, we call this uh, inflammatory condition of the skin, spongiotic dermatitis. And what is spongiosis? Spongiosis is defined as an intercellular edema within the epidermis. And here is a schematic. These are keratinocytes of the spinous layer of the epidermis. And uh, as you can see, they have nucleocytoplasm. And all these uh, intercellular connections are the intercellular bridges. When edema fluid accumulates, uh, between cells in the epidermis, between cells of the spinous layer in the epidermis, these intercellular bridges are stretched and uh, the spaces are widened. To go to a further detail, these intercellular bridges are actually the desmosomes between the epithelial cells. So here is um, how spongiosis looks in real life. This is a high power view of the epidermis with a portion of the granular cell layer, but the majority of our screen shows the spinous layer of the epidermis. And we see that 
uh, the spaces between the keratinocytes are widened and we can even see the intercellular bridges. So this is spongiosis. Where does this edema fluid come from to go in the epidermis? Well, this is important to know uh, as a uh, pathophysiologic process. It comes from the superficial vessels, from the blood. This is a serum uh, or edema fluid that uh, leaks out of the vessels and then it goes into the epidermis uh, and then we use the term spongiosis. When spongiotic fluid becomes uh, increases in volume and there is tremendous spongiosis, tremendous um, separation between the keratinocytes, they can detach from each other and then the spongiotic fluid can accumulate and form spongiotic vesicles. So this accumulation of spongiotic fluid within the epidermis is termed spongiotic vesicles. Here is one spongiotic vesicle and a portion of another. So this is a space in the epidermis that has some edema fluid and a few inflammatory cells. At the periphery of the spongiotic vesicle, we see a portion of the epidermis, particularly the spinous layer, with spongiosis and intercellular bridges that are now visible because they are stretched by the spongiotic fluid. So, by definition, spongiotic dermatitis is an inflammatory disease of the skin in which the principal histopathologic finding is spongiosis. What is exocytosis? Exocytosis is the presence of inflammatory cells within the epidermis, leukocytes of different types. This inflammatory cells may be lymphocytes, they may be neutrophils, or they may be eosinophils. And the type of, a, of the inflammatory cell seen in the epidermis can really help us with making a correct diagnosis because certain diseases uh, present in a certain way with a specific uh, inflammatory cell type that predominates. Here is an example of exocytosis. In this case, there are lymphocytes that uh, are present within the epidermis, inflammatory cells. Lymphocytes in the epidermis pointed by the arrows. This exocytosis is accompanied by spongiosis. We can see how stretched the intercellular bridges are, and here uh, the beginning of the formation of spongiotic vesicles, separation of the keratinocytes and accumulation of spongiotic fluid. As we mentioned, in spongiotic dermatitis, we may have different inflammatory cells that predominate, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and neutrophils. Now, spongiosis with predominantly lymphocytes can be seen in a number of inflammatory conditions which are termed uh, in different ways. As we mentioned, the spongiotic dermatitis is an inflammatory disease of the skin in which the principal histopathologic finding is spongiosis in the epidermis. Uh, under the term spongiotic dermatitis are included a number of clinical entities that share similar histopathologic find findings, the main of which is spongiosis. They also share similarities uh, in the morphology of the individual lesions uh, clinically. And these lesions are erythematous macules, papules, plaques, which may be scaling and may be lichenified. So under the term spongiotic dermatitis, the, the, which is a histopathologic term, there are multiple clinical conditions that uh, clinical entities 
that can go under this uh, broad category of spongiotic dermatitis. And these are allergic contact dermatitis, nomular dermatitis, photoallergic dermatitis, seborrheic, dyshydrotic dermatitis, pityriasis rosea. Even in dermatophytosis, we can see spongiosis in erythema annularis centrifugum or EAC and geonotic Rusty syndrome. I cannot advance for some reason. All right, why can I not advance? It's not happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you, I, I see your error, so it is still kind of, uh, uh, the connection is good. Maybe you want to close your presentation and reopen it. Okay. Oh, I can't even close it. I can't escape. That's interesting. It froze. Oh, here, it froze. Let's see whether, okay. Do you have to send me again the... I don't think so because I, I see your presentation. So if you open it up again, I think it should be... Maybe we go back to the... To where I was? Yeah. Right here. Yep. Okay. I hope it advanced. Oh, great. Great. So let's start with allergic contact dermatitis. For the pathologists, we don't often see clinical pictures of uh, what we are looking for. Uh, at under the microscope. So this is an example of allergic contact dermatitis. This is an allergic reaction um, that is seen on the foot of this uh, person with an erythematous and edematous plaque uh, of the dorsal foot and, and toes. Now, allergic contact dermatitis um, can be due to multiple um, allergens, uh, but they are presented to the skin by contact. Um, and this is the reason the name is allergic contact dermatitis. Allergic contact dermatitis is a type 4 cell-mediated delayed hypersensitivity reaction. The reaction is usually against a uh, an allergen, often a small hapten, uh, complexed with a larger protein in the skin. So here we see this small molecule, small haptens, uh, which uh, often react with a larger protein. And in this case, the allergen is exogenous. It comes from the outside. However, the allergen may be endogenous. It may come from inside of the body uh, and be presented uh, to the epidermis. Uh, this uh, antigen, uh, in this case the allergen or the antigen, is presented, uh, is, uh, presented to Langerhans cells which process the antigen and then they present this antigen to lymphocytes. These lymphocytes then travel to the original lymph node through the lymphatics and there there is a clonal expansion of this sensitized T lymphocytes. So these T lymphocytes are particularly sensitized to this allergen. Nothing happens during the first exposure to the allergen. However, during the second exposure, this clone of previously sensitized lymphocytes expand, they proliferate, and then they travel back to the skin where they meet with the allergen and react with the allergen. Inflammation ensues and a hence allergic contact dermatitis. Here is what we see under the microscope. There is epidermis 
with prominent, uh, the epidermis is hyperplastic. In addition, there is prominent spongiosis in some areas, large spongiotic vesicles with accumulation of edema fluid, numerous inflammatory cells or exocytosis, some edema of the papillary dermis, and inflammatory infiltrate in the underlying dermis. The inflammatory infiltrate is uh, usually around vessels, perivascular, and mostly lymphocytic, and I can see a few eosinophils, a few reddish uh, elements here and there. So this is an example of allergic contact dermatitis, low power view. So what happens at the beginning? The inflammatory cells are in the blood vessels, and they um, get out of the blood vessels. So of course, at the very beginning, the inflammatory infiltrate is perivascular, and then the inflammatory cells travel to the epidermis where they present as exocytosis. At the higher power view, we can see again the prominent spongiosis with stretching of the intercellular bridges, spongiotic vesicles, inflammatory cells in the spongiotic vesicles, and focal perikeratosis. In the dermis, uh, there is a mixed cell infiltrate with prominent eosinophils, usually lymphocytes and eosinophils in allergic contact dermatitis. Numula dermatitis is another clinical presentation of the histopathologic term spongiotic dermatitis. This dermatitis is called numular because the lesions resemble a coin. Numular means coin-like. So they are round or oval patches erythematous patches with a scale, usually present on the back of the hands, arms. Under the microscope, we see similar picture to the allergic contact dermatitis. However, lymphocytes are, I'm sorry, eosinophils are completely absent or they are rarely seen within the infiltrate. In this case, the epidermis shows psoriasiform hypoplasia. It is hypoplastic and somewhat resembles the epidermis in psoriasis. We see fossae of spongiosis, this empty whitish spaces, are areas where spongiotic fluid accumulated. We see prominent lymphocytes in the epidermis, exocytosis, and we see uh, a scale crust. This is parakeratosis, retention of nuclei of keratinocytes. This is the scale overlying the epidermis in this particular case. In the dermis, there is a mainly perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, and although this is a somewhat low power view, we don't see eosinophils. At higher power, we see that the majority of the inflammatory cells are lymphocytes with occasional neutrophils here and there. Again, spongiosis, exocytosis, and overlying parakeratosis. This is numular dermatitis. The lymphocytes are the main inflammatory cell in the dermis. Eosinophils are rarely, if ever, present in numular dermatitis. Dermatitis could be, examined as dermatitis, could be acute could be present for a while, or it could become chronic uh, after uh, repetitive exposure to the allergen. In this case, on the right, we see chronic dermatitis, which is secondary to nickel from the uh, button of these genes. So that's chronic nickel dermatitis. In this case, there is chronic dermatitis to the material shoes are made. In chronic dermatitis, because of the um, long time in which the dermatitis is present, uh, in addition to itching, there is a lot of rubbing, and the lesions are lichenified. They are thickened. There is a scale crust uh, that covers the lesion. What do we see under the microscope in cases like that? 
we see the main findings of spongiotic dermatitis, which are mainly spongiosis in the epidermis, dilated spaces, widened spaces between the keratinocytes in the spinous layer. We see inflammatory cells, in this case lymphocytes, exocytosis in the epidermis, and in this case, because it's chronic dermatitis, we see a lot of lichenification. In other words, there are features of lichen simplex chronicus. What are these features? The thick, elongated reti ridges, overall, the epidermis is thickened and shows somewhat psoriasiform epidermal hyperplasia. We have prominent granular cell layer, hypergranulosis or thickened granular cell layer. We, we see overlying parakeratosis and a little bit of serum in the scale crust. So these are the features of lichen simplex chronicus. Maybe it's hard to tell here, but there is a little bit of fibrosis of the papillary dermis. This is not bad with vertical streaks of thickened uh, uh, fibrous uh, fibers in the papillary dermis. In addition, there is an inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes uh, around superficial vessels. Spongiotic dermatitis uh, has different stages, early, fully developed, and late. Uh, Dr. Bernie Ackerman published an entire book that was called uh, Lives of Lesions. And in this book, he um, examines different clinical entities at different stages. When you biopsy an early stage of psoriasis or early stage of spongiotic dermatitis, it's going to look in one way. If you uh, biopsy a fully developed lesion, it will look different. If you, develop, if you biopsy a late lesion, you may not even find diagnostic changes of whatever the, the entity is. So it's very important to know which lesion to biopsy and it's important to know what you're dealing with. Early lesion, fully developed or late. In this example, uh, we have an early lesion of spongiotic dermatitis. As we mentioned earlier, the first step is the extravasation of um, inflammatory cells, the, 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 um, the inflammatory cells get out of the bloodstream, out of the vessels, and are positioned in a perivascular distribution, after which they travel towards the epidermis where the antigen is uh, present to attack the antigen. So in early lesions, we may not have a lot of spongiosis. As you can see, well, most of the epidermis here is normal. We have focal um, area of spongiosis and exocytosis. We have one little spongiotic vesicle. But most importantly, the keratin layer is basket woven keratin. It didn't have time to change to turn into a layer of parakeratosis. So this is an early lesion of spongiotic dermatitis. In fully developed lesions, we have all the features of a fully blown uh, spongiotic dermatitis, in this case, allergic contact. We have prominent epidermal hyperplasia, spongiosis, spongiotic vesicles, exocytosis. We have overlying parakeratosis and pretty dense inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis sometimes papillary dermal edema. This is a late stage in eczematous dermatitis. In late stages, we may even find changes only of lichen simplex chronicus, as in this stage. Look at the very um, hyperplastic epidermis with elongated reti ridges, thickened epidermis, acanthotic, prominent granular cell layer, and overlying a hyperkeratosis compact keratin layer, perhaps focal parakeratosis. In this example, there is only one small focus of spongiosis and exocytosis that gives us a clue that this was probably spongiotic dermatitis, eczematous dermatitis, 
uh, that is now in a late stage and we mostly see lichen simplex chronicus, the changes of lichen simplex chronicus. In addition to the epidermal changes, we have a mild perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. What is photoallergic dermatitis? Uh, in photoallergic dermatitis, uh, there is an allergic reaction to a substance that uh, reacts with the light. Uh, for example, photoallergic dermatitis could be uh, produced due to perfumes, uh, certain creams, uh, and other um, topical creams that we can we put on our skin. In this case, you see that only uh, areas that are exposed to the light, in this case, this person's forehead, is affected. The area that was covered by hair is not affected by this dermatitis. In photoallergic dermatitis, we see the very same features as we see in allergic uh, contact dermatitis. A lot of eosinophils in the inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis and spongiosis, spongiotic vesicles, and inflammatory cells, i.e. exocytosis in the epidermis. Many of these inflammatory cells are also eosinophils. So the only uh, clue that this may be a photoallergic dermatitis is that the clinicians tell us that. They have to tell us that uh, these uh, the, the rash is basically present on photo-exposed areas or the rash happened after um, the patient uh, put some lotion, let's say, on the skin and then was exposed to light. Otherwise, histologically, we cannot tell apart photoallergic dermatitis from allergic contact dermatitis. They look the same. The findings are the same slightly higher view, again with numerous spongiotic vesicles, spongiotic fluid, and inflammatory cells with numerous, numerous eosinophils in the epidermis as well as in the infiltrate uh, in the papillary dermis. Irritant contact dermatitis, diaper rash, is a great example of that. Uh, in this type of dermatitis, there is a, a contact with some irritant that causes uh, necrosis of the keratinocyte. Here is an example. It is usually an acute process, especially if an early lesion is biopsied. So there is, um, depending on the severity of the dermatitis, there may be individual uh, necrotic keratinocytes or sometimes the entire epidermis may be necrotic such as in this case we can see here uh, keratinocytes that had lost their um, cellular details and their nuclei as opposed to normal epidermis here and here the epidermis because of necrotic keratinocytes had lifted and we see a portion uh, of epidermis in the roof of this large vesicle and please note that the, the keratin layer is basket woven which testifies to the acuteness of the process so some, somebody, this uh, patient, was subjected to this uh, very um, um, irritant material that caused necrosis of the epidermis. As you can see, there are inflammatory cells within this uh, large vesicle or boa and numerous inflammatory cells in the underlying dermis in a perivascular and interstitial uh, distribution, but mostly perivascular. A higher power view showing you again that there are ghosts of keratinocytes. These are not viable keratinocytes. In this particular area, we still see a few viable keratinocytes, but the rest is just necrotic, completely necrotic due to the irritant. Another variety of a dermatitis is seborrheic dermatitis. This is a dermatitis that looks clinically greasy, oily, and 
it presents in the uh, so-called um, uh, seborrheic areas. These are the scalp, usually forehead, around the ears, a little bit towards the neck. Uh, seborrheic dermatitis presents as erythematous papules and plaques with a greasy scale. In general, all the features we see in uh, spongiotic dermatitis are seen in seborrheic dermatitis. In other words, we can see spongiosis, exocytosis, and an inflammatory infiltrate in the superficial dermis. One feature that can uh, point us into the direction of seborrheic dermatitis is the presence of parakeratosis at the lips of follicular ostea. So this is a hair follicle here. Here is the hair shaft. It is slightly um, dilated. And at this follicular ostium, right at the lip with the epidermis, adjacent epidermis, we see parakeratosis. So parakeratosis seen at the beginning uh, of the follicular ostea is a clue to seborrheic dermatitis. This hydrotic dermatitis presents with deep-seated vesicles and nodules on the palms and soles. As you can see, these vesicles can rupture and they, they open up eroded areas um, on acro skin. They are itchy and uh, they can present with pain. Under the microscope, we identify that we are dealing with acro skin. We have epidermis that is very hyperplastic in this case. We have a still pretty good uh, granular cell layer, and this is compact, thick layer of compact keratin. In this hydrotic dermatitis, again, we see all the features of spongiotic dermatitis, spongiosis in the spinous layer, spongiotic vesicles, and because clinically this dermatitis presents with deep-seated vesicles, what are these vesicles? I'm sorry. These vesicles are basically um, the uh, spongiotic vesicles that have accumulated spongiotic fluid uh, and inflammatory cells. There is also an inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis. Usually, eosinophils are rare or not present at all. Higher view to show you the spongiosis, spongiotic vesicles, and exocytosis. Pityriasis rosea is another type of spongiotic dermatitis under the microscope. It usually affects children from age 6 to 12, sometimes young adults, uh, and, and middle-aged adults as well, uh, more rarely. Um, it comes with a prodrome of fatigue, malaise, and uh, perhaps a headache, uh, with which a lesion between 2 and 5 centimeters oval patch called herald patch arises. It's an erythematous thin plaque with the scale. After this herald patch uh, appears somewhere on the body, um, later, perhaps a week or 10 days later, more lesions appear, which can be papules or uh, many lesions are uh, oval or elongated, about a centimeter or two centimeters. And sometimes on the back, they can be oriented in a way that they form a Christmas tree they um, uh, are parallel to each other. Pityriasis rosea, uh, again, as being a spongiotic dermatitis, shows all the features of spongiotic dermatitis. Spongiosis, exocytosis, and perivascular inflammatory infiltrate. How can we differentiate it from other types of spongiotic dermatitis? There are a few differentiating features that can help us. In pityriasis rosea, there are mounds of parakeratosis. So the parakeratosis is, uh, presents in, in small kind of rounded uh, collections. 
we have in this photomicrograph three areas of mounted, very discrete areas of parakeratosis, not broad parakeratosis as we saw in other types of spongiotic dermatitis. So mounted, discrete fossae of parakeratosis and often extravasated erythrocytes in the papillary dermis close to the epidermis and occasionally we may even see extravasated erythrocytes within the epidermis. Always, as in every spongiotic dermatitis, there is a perivascular inflammatory infiltrate. And in spongiotic dermatitis, since the main action is the spongiosis in the epidermis, and in general the epidermal changes, the infiltrate is usually superficial. The infiltrate does not go beyond mid-reticular dermis. Higher power view, here are the mounds of parakeratosis, discrete mounds, exocytosis, spongiosis, extravasated erythrocytes. As I mentioned, this may be a clue together with the mounted parakeratosis for pityriasis rosea. Spongiosis, exocytosis, and here is the parakeratosis with retention of nuclei of keratinocytes. Dermatophytosis is a superficial fungal infection which may mimic clinically dermatitis. Here is an erythematous patch with a scale and it can present, although it's a fungal infection, it can mimic spongiotic dermatitis under the microscope because we may see spongiosis spongiotic vesicles and exocytosis together with an inflammatory infiltrate in the superficial dermis. So if we are not careful and if we do not examine the keratin layer and if we do not perform a PAS stain, we can make a diagnosis of spongiotic dermatitis when the patient actually has a superficial fungal infection. And here is the PAS stain showing fungal, it's a little dark, but you can recognize the, fu the uh, fungal hyphae here in the cornified layer. And usually these hyphae are present uh, in the superficial epidermis, mainly cornified layer. However, sometimes they may be even seen uh, in, the more, in the lower levels of the epidermis. Erythema annularis centrifugum. This is uh, an entity in which uh, there, are, it, there are erythematous annular plaques, erythema, annulari, annular, centrifugum, because they have a scale that denotes the advancing edge of the lesions. This is a very uh, good example of an annular lesion of erythema annulari centrifugum. What do we see under the microscope? we see a superficial and deep perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate which is tightly capped, very tightly present around the vessels. In EAC, we do not see epidermal changes, so it's not actually a spongiotic dermatitis. However, there is a variant of EAC in which we may see spongiotic changes such as here. We have mild spongiosis and we have the scale crust that we saw in the clinical picture. So we may have parakeratosis in addition to the lymphocytic infiltrate. So that's a spongiotic variant of EAC which in essence is not spongiotic dermatitis. Geonotic crust syndrome is a syndrome that uh, affects uh, usually children, and uh, young adults, it presents uh, as um, macules and plaques. Histologically, it's a lymphocytic um, dermatitis. In other words, the, in the main inflammatory cell is the lymphocyte. Therefore, there are lymphocytes around superficial vessels and numerous lymphocytes in the epidermis together with the scale crust containing parakeratosis and some nuclear debris, cellular debris. Here is again 
foci of prominence spondylosis and exocytosis together with uh, parakeratosis and, and dermal infiltrate. Now, when do we see spongiosis with eosinophils? In multiple conditions, such as incontinentia pigmenti, a blistering disorders, bullous pamphigoid, pamphigus vulgaris, drug eruptions, sometimes even arthropod assaults, herpes gestationis, pleuritic urticarial papus, and plaques of pregnancy. And let's go over those. Incontinentia pigmentae is an X-linked disorder that is uh, seen in, in girls uh, because we believe that the males uh, probably die in utero. Uh, there are a few stages. The first stage is present at birth or is developed shortly after birth and presents with erythematous papules and, and vesicles in a linear arrangement following Blaschko's lines. That's the, the early or first stage of the disease. In the second stage, there are linear verrucous lesions. And in the third stage, which is um, present here on the right, uh, there is a pigmentation in an irregular, somewhat world uh, distribution. Again, following Blaschko's lines. What do we see? in early stage of incontinentia pigmenti. Prominent spongiosis in the epidermis with large spongiotic vesicles and numerous, numerous eosinophils within these spongiotic vesicles and within the adjacent epidermis as well as underlying dermis. Here are the numerous eosinophils. So this is eosinophilic exocytosis, eosinophils within this spongiotic vesicle and eosinophils also in the underlying dermis. Bullous pamphigoid is a blistering disorder in which we see very tense bullae on erythematous face. Bullous pamphigoid, however, may have an urticarial stage in which we don't see the bullae. Patients present only with urticarial lesions similar to, to those without, without any blisters developing, so it may be difficult to diagnose such a stage as a blistering disorder if we don't help the clinicians. And how may we help the clinicians? In those cases of um, bullous pamphigoid, which still don't have uh, formed uh, bullae or blisters with subepidermal uh, subepidermal blisters with separation of the epidermis from the underlying dermis, we see uh, a stage that precedes that, such as this one. There is a dense inflammatory infiltrate in which eosinophils predominate in the dermis. In addition, we see a lot of eosinophils in the epidermis and collections of eosinophils in spongiotic vesicles. Whenever we see eosinophils, climbing up the epidermis and within the epidermis, this is a clue to a blistering disorder. Of course, we can see eosinophils in allergic contact dermatitis as part of the entire picture, but uh, in an urticarial stage of a blistering disorder, we see usually a few more eosinophils than in allergic, in allergic contact dermatitis, and they may aggregate in the epidermis here they are present in a spongiotic vesicle, but here we see a lot of them getting together and they may also concentrate in high, they can concentrate high in the dermal papillae. So this is a clue, this is one of Bernie's clues for, blister, for the carrier stage of a blistering disorder. Here they are again, numerous eosinophils within the epidermis, in the inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis and within spongiotic vesicles. Pamphigus vulgaris can also present with an urticarial stage. It's a blistering disorder in which the bullae are uh, flaccid and they are easily eroded and they leave these um, large eroded surfaces. Uh, predilection for the trunk, 
in this uh, disease and in uh, Pamphigus vulgaris when we don't see a full uh, blister or full boa we see the initial in an initial stage we can see a little bit of acanthalysis in the epidermis but mainly we see spongiosis and eosinophilic exocytosis see how rapidly this particular lesion developed we still have normal basket woven keratin layer so everything really happened very rapidly and there are numerous numerous eosinophils in the underlying dermis here they are again in the epidermis so the eosinophil is the predominant inflammatory cell in uh, this condition pamphigus foliaceous is um, a type of pamphigus which is superficial and um, the, the vesicles are very uh, thin flaccid vesicles um, that easily rupture and leave those trails under the microscope we see acanthalysis in the upper layers of the epidermis here are a few acantholytic cells and a little bit of a, a roof of a small vesicle again what can help us what is the clue that we may make the diagnosis when we don't have a well-developed vesicle the fact that we have spongiosis uh, and exocytosis with eosinophils and inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis containing eosinophils is a clue if we are lucky to see the acanthalysis in the upper layers of the epidermis that definitely can help us in the differential diagnosis drug eruptions is another area another a whole group of conditions in which we may see spongiosis in general uh, the mo probably the two most commonly seen types of drug eruptions are the morbilliform one and the lichenoid drug eruption uh, however there may be a spongiotic drug eruption which will present with similar um, findings as in spongiotic dermatitis here we have fossae of spongiosis, uh, exocytosis, and an inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis containing eosinophils. So usually we have eosinophils in this uh, type of spongiotic drug reaction. However, if you don't find eosinophils, do not get discouraged because uh, some drug reactions may present with lack of eosinophils. If the clinical history, however, is very strong that the eruption developed let's say 10 days or two weeks after the ingestion of the drug uh, and uh, all the findings are pointing to that direction we may be dealing with a spongiotic a drug reaction here are the eosinophils in the dermal infiltrate sometimes arthropod bites may cause um, spongiosis and here is an example so this is a bite with a uh, relatively wet shaped inflammatory infiltrate prominent papillary dermal edema look at the epidermis very very stretched this is reticular degeneration of the epidermis and also numerous uh, spongiotic vesicles uh, in this case here they are they focally merge together and there are numerous inflammatory cells again look basket woven keratin so this process happened acutely numerous eosinophils uh, in a bug bite uh, if there are vesicles usually the vesicles are large in the center and they diminish in size towards the periphery and they are the largest in the center because that's where the hibiscus or whatever the um, the bug uh, penetrated this is the area where the bug penetrated the skin scabies here is the creature in the upper layers of the epidermis subcorneal however with scabies let's say we don't have the creature on our slide but we may have spongiosis uh, eosinophils or eosinophilic exocytosis in the epidermis and mixed cell dermal infiltrate in the dermis um, which may be a clue to something going on 
and we should cut multiple levels to look for the culprit. Tick, in a tick bite, as you can see here, here is the tick, and this is the skin and large spongiotic vesicle here formed right next to the um, head and the mouth parts of the tick are filled with neutrophils so and eosinophils. Spongiosis may occur in different conditions that are not necessarily spongiotic dermatitis but uh, can be explained by different factors. Herpes gestationis uh, presents in the second trimester with uh, arcuate lesions um, which uh, may be erythematous and there are definitely uh, some uh, bullae and vesicles and blisters. In uh, herpes gestationis again we may have a urticarial stage in which there is only spongiosis. Occasional eosinophils, look at this few eosinophils trying to go up in the epidermis. This is the clue that uh, maybe we are dealing with an urticarial state of blistering disorder and then in this case immunofluorescent studies may be very helpful. Here they are again climbing the epidermis. A pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy or pop they usually appear in the uh, in prima in prima gravida in the third trimester and uh, near the umbilicus is the site of predilection, papules and plaques, erythematous. Again, we may see the urticarial stage with spongiosis, look at this eosinophils again in the epidermis and uh, mixed cell infiltrate of lymphocytes and eosinophils in the dermis, papillary dermoedema. At times it may be impossible to tell apart uh, histologically whether we are dealing to tell apart these lesions, whether we are dealing with pop or bullous pemphigoid or pemphigus vulgaris in their urticarial stage. That's why immunofluorescent studies are mandatory uh, helping us to see uh, what may be the actual diagnosis. Now sometimes we see spongiosis with neutrophils. We may see that in dermatophytosis, in toxic shock syndrome, IgA pemphigus, urticarial stage. In dermatophytosis, we see a lot of in uh, a lot of um, neutrophils, uh, usually in the upper layers of the epidermis. We may see small pustules. Pustule is a collection of neutrophils in the upper layers of the epidermis. Uh, there is also spongiosis and here neutrophilic exocytosis with perikeratosis, scale crust. And this is the PAS stain, multiple fungal hyphae in the thick and cornified layer that also contains perikeratosis. Here are the neutrophils, again with numerous hyphae in the vicinity, beautifully stained by the PAS stain. Sometimes we, we may see Follicular spongiosis uh, in infundibular folliculitis, eosinophilic folliculitis, or atopic dermatitis. Uh, infundibular folliculitis. What is this? Well, it's a it's an inflammatory condition in which uh, we see mainly the main changes are seen in the infundibulum of the hair follicle. So here in this infundibulum, we have the same changes we see in spongiotic dermatitis but they are not present in the adjacent epidermis. We see spongiosis, exocytosis and spongiotic vesicles. Eosinophilic folliculitis is folliculitis in which the predominant cell uh, is the eosinophil filling the expanded uh, follicular infundibulum. Numerous eosinophils and neutrophils. <clears throat> in miliaria which is acrosyringeal problem, we may see spongiosis. Miliaria crystallina rubra and profunda uh, are different types of miliaria depending on which portion of the eccrine duct is affected. Miliaria crystallina affects the sweat duct um, within the stratum corneum. Miliaria rubra the sweat duct 
within deeper layers of the epidermis and profunda uh, deep uh, at the base of the epidermis and uh, at the uh, level of the papillary dermis. Spongiosis could also be seen in other conditions and there is only one that I would mention. And I am sure most of you have recognized this as mycosis fungoides. Why? Because the lymphocytes present in the epidermis are very large and hyperchromatic. It's hard to tell, but they, we can see that they have irregular nuclear contours. Also, in mycosis fungoides, there are a lot of lymphocytes in the epidermis for very little spongiosis. So very little accompanying spongiosis for a big density of cells, which in this case are not inflammatory cells, uh, but uh, neoplastic cells, because this is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So there is a spongiotic variant of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, absolutely fantastic talk and uh, it is a great overview of the spongiotic dermatitis and we went to a lot of different kind of conditions so it was a great tour. Uh, thank you so much for it. Uh, I would like to open up the floor for people who would like to ask uh, Dr. Lazova questions uh, regarding uh, her talk and also you know if you have some other questions you this is your chance now to ask this. Uh, until you guys are, you, you can put it into the chat window and then uh, I will read it or, or uh, we can read it, just type it and, and then send it. In the meantime, you know, I would like to ask you a, a question. It was very, very interesting that, you know, looking at the pictures that you showed and, you know, the hot things are picked up in the uh, epidermis by the longer hand cells and how the lymphoid reaction is uh, kind of evolving. I always wanted to do, you know, one of the things is to uh, do a confocal imaging of the... Yes, the skin. mechanism. And, and that would be a, a, a super interesting study, I think, you know, because we have these theories, but basically we would be able to image the epidermis and being able to label those cells and actually uh, I know that animal models probably show it, but it would be very, very interesting to see how the pathways are actually changing uh, in, in, in different uh, kind of spongiotic processes. That, have you thought about that? Or in, in Yale, you guys have facilities to do maybe live confocal imaging? That, that, that's a great idea. Uh, some people have actually with uh, special cameras, they have photographed uh, melanocytes, how they transfer the melanosomes to keratinocytes and stuff like that. So uh, it would be very interesting to to photograph how the whole inflammatory process uh, begins and what cells go where and why. Uh, so that's fascinating if we can do that. We at Yale do not have a confocal microscopy and, and therefore we haven't thought about uh, studying that uh, by this modality but it would be very, really very interesting to do that. And probably some other people are thinking of doing it. Yeah, I think it's always, it was, I, I used to do confocal imaging and that was one of the things that I always wanted to do, but it is, you know, uh, uh, never happening because uh, uh, we would be able to learn a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, things about it. And also for mycosis fungus, it was a, a very good thing to hear that the, uh, at the end of the talk that uh, what is your biggest clue or what do you really put the, the most, uh, uh, this one that you are showing is, is a really atypical one, but there are cases which are really coming with a lot of spongiosis. What is your best and most reliable clue for differentiating uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma because there are sometimes you know the psoriasis form spongiotic uh, dermatitis that uh, turn out to be lymphoma. What would be your suggestion or, or, or best clue for differentiating CTCL from uh, um, like a reactive process? Um, that's a very good question because often it's very difficult 
to the, the biopsy comes with the questions uh, eczema or CPCL and um, things are not that clear as in this photograph um, there is often more spongiosis than is expected we are ex we're expecting to see if this was a CDCL patient CDCL case um, so basically what I look for is the amount of spongiosis if there are a lot of lymphocytes with little spongiosis to me this is in favor of CDCL there are not usually in CDCL there are no spongiotic vesicles the spongiosis is minimal uh, also I look at the cells the cells are usually large um, they are usually hypochromatic and their nuclear contours are irregular but again this could be a subtle finding and and often multiple biopsies over time over years and years may be necessary to um, to make the diagnosis of CTCL and there are even patients who have CTCL and uh, at times when they are biopsied their lesions only show changes of spongiotic dermatitis so um, maybe they're so subtle that we cannot diagnose them at one point I see. Well, I'm actually a true believer that uh, there is some sort of an antigenic process that is basically ticking off the normal mechanisms and making it, you know, a, a clonal neoplastic process from something that is like, a, a, you know, a chronic eczematous thing. And the machinery is kind of very, very similar that a chronic eczematous process is using. Uh, <clears throat> and there is not such a big difference uh, regarding, you know, the pathway between uh, CTCL or at least, you know, those that are very close to spongiotic processes uh, and the malignant lymphoma. I agree completely, yes. Uh, Rosisa, thank you so much again. Uh, well, we have here a question from Saira. How uh, to differentiate bullous diseases from vesicles and other dermatitis? And what is your opinion? When would you order immunofluorescence? And then there is another question also. Okay, so um, in, if, we, if we have classic changes of bullous diseases in, in bullous pemphigoid, there will be a subepidermal blister that will contain eosinophils within the blister cavity, and then there will be a mixed cell inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes and eosinophils in the dermis, underlying dermis. In uh, Pamphigus vulgaris, there will be acanthoysis uh, with a tombstone appearing uh, appearance of the so that the base, the basal keratinocytes will be still attached to um, the uh, bottom of the blister, and there will be collection again of inflammatory cells, but not much fluid within. Uh, the blister cavity with mixed cell inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis. Um, in the, the urticarial stages may be, uh, may be tricky, but if you have uh, an urticarial stage, then clinically they would submit the biopsy. I know that sometimes clinicians don't give us much information, but they would submit the biopsy as uh, perhaps urticaria, something that is not eczema because it's mostly dermal and in those biopsies we may see uh, one or two, just a few eosinophils going up to the epidermis with a little bit of spongiosis and that would be a clue to a blistering disorder. Uh, if we have a lot of spongiosis and these spongiotic vesicles are intraepidermal as we saw in the allergic contact dermatitis, this is spongiotic dermatitis. So in other words, in the blistering diseases, the separation, the formation of the blister is specific for bullous pemphigoid subepidermal, for pemphigus uh, acanthalysis with suprabasal separation, um, with der dermatitis herpetiformis collection of uh, usually neutrophils in the dermal papillae with separation there. Um, and if we only see spongiotic vesicles uh, well formed in the epidermis scattered within the spinous layer of the epidermis, that would be 
for examatus slash spongy dermatitis. Thank you very much. And, and then Martina has another question. If you suspect bullous perfugoid urticaria stage, do you do immunofluorescence and paraffin samples or ask for another biopsy? Right. So we unfortunately, we cannot do immunofluorescence studies on paraffin samples. They have to give us a fresh biopsy. Uh, they put the tissue in a special media called uh, Michel's um, media, which preserves the tissue. Uh, for immunofluorescent studies, the tissue is then frozen and uh, fresh frozen sections are cut and stained with immunoreactants. Uh, so unfortunately, another biopsy is needed and it's important what to biopsy and where. To make a histopathologic diagnosis, you biopsy a well-developed lesion. Uh, you may even biopsy the blister, the edge of the blister where you can include the uh, portion of the blister and, and normal skin. For immunofluorescent studies, one has to uh, biopsy perilesional skin because um, if lesional skin is biopsied, uh, there is a chance that the immunofluorescent studies may be falsely negative. So perilesional skin, uh, the skin um, that is just next to a well-developed lesion but does not show clinically any changes is the best uh, area to biopsy for, for IF. Thank you so much. Uh, great questions and uh, uh, fantastic answer. Uh, I would like to <coughs> conclude the session. I just sent uh, our email to you. It is dermtalks at gmail.com. Uh, those of you who are visiting for the very first time, if you think that this is something that you can learn or like and please send us an email. My name is Laszlo, Laszlo Karai. To this email address, it is not my personal email address, so I may not get back with you uh, right in five minutes, but I'm going to do it in a timely fashion. And before we would close, there is one more question from Lubna. How, uh, how to differentiate spongiotic dermatitis from pustules, pustular psoriasis in difficult cases? That will be probably... Oh, very good question. Very good question. So. Uh, in pustular psoriasis, there, is a, there are pustules. And what is a pustule? By definition, a pustule is a collection of neutrophils uh, in the epidermis, usually in the upper layers of the epidermis. So um, in, pustu in, in, in pustular psoriasis, uh, there are pustules, but overall, there are no other findings in the epidermis. Uh, the pustules are only collections of neutrophils with very little spongiosis, if any. Just collections, dense collections of neutrophils. Uh, and this is it, pustules scattered throughout the epidermis in, in, in general. Um, in spongiotic dermatitis, we saw in some of the examples, the spongiotic vesicle contain a lot of spongiotic fluid, which is uh, pale pink or... Um, usually pale pink, um, with some inflammatory cells. Um, but the inflammatory cells are, are, are different, of different types. So in psoriasis, they're always neutrophils and only neutrophils. In spongiotic dermatitis, we have a lot of spongiosis because these are spongiotic vesicles, accumulation of spongiotic fluid to form the vesicles, and the inflammatory cells are of different types. They uh, uh, are lymphocytes, maybe a few eosinophils, a few neutrophils, but they are never only neutrophils. So that's very helpful. And in general, in the infiltrate, in, uh, in the inflammatory dermal infiltrate in psoriasis, we don't see eosinophils. Unless, of course, the patient has hyper eosinophilia for some other reasons and stuff like that. But in general, the main inflammatory cell in the dermis uh, is the lymphocyte. Great. Thank you so much, Rosica, and thank you so much for your hour and everyone to visit us and, and logging in for this afternoon meeting. It was a, a great session. And uh, we are going to have a couple of uh, talks again. Usually it is on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock to try to uh, keep it and hope to see you there. We will send you information about that. So with all that, 
have a good night and those of you who came from uh, you know eastern from us uh, maybe good morning or good evening who are from west from us okay so take care thank, thank you very you. much for inviting me goodbye everybody i hope it was helpful it was great thank you so much rosita bye bye good night thank you